My name is Sandor Katz. I've been obsessed with fermentation for almost 25 years now. Fermented foods and beverages have been transformed by the action of microorganisms. Bacteria and fungi are present on all our food, and for thousands of years our ancestors everywhere have been learning how to work with these invisible life forces in order to make food more delicious, more stable, and more nutritious, and simultaneously keep it safe and prevent or postpone decomposition. I've written a couple of books on the subject, taught hundreds of workshops, and I call myself a fermentation revivalist. In my quest for information on fermentation around the world, I've been able to learn a good deal about Eastern European fermentation traditions and Japanese and Korean fermentation traditions and those of Africa and many other regions. But until now, I was unable to learn much at all about fermentation in a place with some of the most ancient and varied traditions which have influenced practices everywhere. China. All the historical stories about sauerkraut point to China as the inspiration. The oldest evidence of alcohol fermentation comes from China. And Asian markets around the world are filled with fermented products from China, including soy sauce, vinegars, fermented black beans, and fermented tofu. But with little practical how-to literature in English, I was unable to learn much about Chinese fermentation methods. That changed for me when I met Mara King. Mara was a student in one of my residency programs who shared my curiosity about fermentation and food in general, and was already accomplished as a fermentation so professional. Mara grew up in Hong Kong, has lived in China, and she and her mother Judy invited me to join them on a journey to Southwest China to start filling this gap in my education. I lived in China as an adventurous 19-year-old student of Chinese language many, many years ago. Since then, I've been living in Boulder, Colorado, where I've worked as a chef, become a mom, and also founded a fermented foods company called Ozuke. Coming back here is a great way for me to reconnect with my roots. I can't wait to eat and discover more about the amazing food culture here and also spend some time on the road with my mum. We start our journey from Chengdu, the capital of Sichuan province. It's a huge metropolis of 7 million people, but somehow it manages to exude a very laid-back vibe. People here seem to have found a balance between fast and slow. And this translates to their food culture as well. We notice that old practices like meat curing are still widespread all around in markets and even at people's homes. In fact, all it took to start our fermentation exploration was to click a photo of some delicious looking sausages hanging to cure outside an apartment window right on the street. Mrs. Ding, whose sausages they were, immediately came out and invited us in. She's a gregarious retiree who seems very excited about our interest in her meat curing. She's also a home pickler and starts showing us her treasure trove of vessels filled with pao tsai, the local pickled vegetables, and other fermented delicacies. We are very intrigued and she gladly agrees to share more of her pickling secrets with us. Later that day, Mrs. Ding sends us on a shopping expedition with her husband. Mr. Ding is an energetic man who looks much younger than his age. I wonder if it's all those pickles that his wife's been feeding him over the years. As soon as we step into the market, we are amazed by the variety and the freshness of the produce around us. My eyes and nose are instinctively drawn to the pickle counters. We see gorgeous piles of crunchy pickled vegetables tossed with peanuts, sesame seeds, chili oil. There are bins filled with bright pickled whole vegetables and others with fermented bean pastes. All these ferments are fundamental ingredients of the local cuisine, and I'm thrilled to see how people make these at home. 
Some of the spices we need are easy to recognize, like star anise, bay leaf, cassia, black cardamom. But some are a bit more obscure. This is what? This is what? This is what? We cross the meat section where curtains of pork cuts reveal the work of the sausage makers. Sichuanese people are amazing meat curers, and in the winter time, it's common practice to buy fresh sausages and air cure them at home, like Mr. and Mrs. Ding do. Meanwhile, Mr. Ding keeps speeding through the stalls, picking up some radishes and a big bag of super spicy red chilies. In true Chinese gentleman style, he makes it clear that sharing the costs of our groceries is out of the question. She won't even take my money. <laughs> Back home, Mrs. Ding is already busy in the kitchen. She tells us we can't possibly work on an empty stomach, so she's fixing some lunch. We're excited to try her sausages, which are steaming on a big pot, slowly getting soft and juicy. She cuts them into long slices and shows us the difference between the spicy and sweet varieties. Mr. Ding joins in the cooking too, showcasing a classic Sichuanese home-style dish, twice-cooked pork. To make twice-cooked pork, Mr. Ding first boils a big chunk of pork belly, but takes it out before it's fully cooked. He slices it finely, revealing the pink raw center of the meat. He heats the wok until smoking hot, then stir-fries the pork belly in its own juices. He then adds garlic, sliced ginger, and a big dollop of fermented bean and chili paste, douban jiang, that gives everything a bright red tint. A splash of light soy sauce and a handful of chopped spring onions and the stir-fry is complete, ready to be served. are amazed at the spontaneous hospitality of the Dings, and time starts to fly between a joke or two and a glass of yellow wine, or five. We are full and almost ready for a nap when Mrs. Ding brings us back to the original reason for our visit, her home pickling lesson. The first recipe is an oil-based chili paste. She starts by washing red chilies in fresh water. Then she chops them. She complains that Mr. Ding bought the wrong kind of chilies. Normally, she would use a bigger, less spicy variety, but she assures us that she's going to make it work. The chilies are then salted abundantly and left to release water for 24 hours. After draining them well, it's time to add spices. She rinses a handful of black cardamom, bay leaves, star anise, Sichuan peppercorns, and a bit of san nai, a Chinese medicinal, and she throws them all in with the chilies. Mrs. Ding says, mix well, then sun dry for four to five days. Once they feel thoroughly dry, cover in vegetable oil. She uses rapeseed oil, closely related to mustard and canola, and available here, fresh pressed and quite delicious. Place spices and oil in the sun for a few days. Then let the mixture ferment in the kitchen for two to three months. After that, keep at room temperature and using cooking for months. We then get to the pao tai. The recipe for the brine is fairly simple. Mrs. Ding starts with boiling water and lets it cool down to room temperature. She adds some slices of ginger, a handful of Sichuan peppercorns, dried red chilies, and black cardamom. And then comes her most important pickling trick, ding ding tang. Also called ma tang, it's an old school type of candy made from malted grains. 
The name Ding Ding Tang has nothing to do with Mrs. Ding, but comes from the unmistakable clanging sound that its vendors make to be recognized on the street. It has an incredible non-Newtonian texture, stringy when pulled, crumbly when hit hard. Mrs. Ding says that using Ding Ding Tang instead of regular sugar is the secret to perfectly crunchy pickles, and we're pretty sure she knows what she's talking about. The brine is now ready to receive slices of vegetables. Mrs. Ding says she can keep her brines for years and just continue adding new vegetables to them. She also adds other goodies. An older brine featured garlic and jujubes. With a mature brine, her pickles are delicious even after only one day of immersion. She also tells us that she is the only one who's allowed to touch them; otherwise, they will certainly get spoiled. Mrs. Ding showed us many more things in her kitchen that day and let us taste everything. She and her family could not possibly have been more helpful or more generous. It set our journey off on a perfect footing with a spontaneous experience of finding exactly what we were seeking. Everyday home fermentation, still alive and well in a big city in China.